there's so much people still in the lockdown, still in the state of that fear that they need to hear this and I hope it will reach them. To start with, I would like to thank Alejandro for inviting me. Uh, it's really an honor to speak with you, the MBA students, the future uh, business leaders of the world. And thank you to the Anahuac Mayab University for, for this opportunity and the many great things we are about to do together. The lockdown economy is something uh, that has given me a lot of information about what's happening with entrepreneurs today, what's happening with the world uh, of business and especially small business. And the four lessons that I'm going to share with you is not something I invented. It is something that um, the fellow business owners shared with me during the 28 interviews from 14 countries and four continents. Let's go to the issue at hand. So what happened during the pandemic? Well, the life of entrepreneur, it's never easy. It was never predictable. But from January 2020, we saw the world turn upside down. And whatever plans people had for 2020, they had to be adapted. They had to be changed. You know, we saw a lot of business models um, not working anymore. Uh, some of them had to be changed. And actually, some of them, on the contrary, uh, started working better. But of course, the majority of the entrepreneurs suffered greatly. And they were not that well protected by any government subsidies or anything like that. And before we go further, I want to keep this uh, interactive. If you have any questions, you know, jump in and just unmute yourself, just ask them, okay? Or you can write them in the chat. So I'll be checking that sometimes. So let's start from the question from me to you. Uh, where do you think people get information from during the times like the pandemic? So where can you as entrepreneur find out what is really happening with other businesses? Well, I think um, sometimes you can look at uh, Forbes magazine or maybe Entrepreneur and see what other companies are saying about what's happening to them. Maybe big companies, not not mainly small companies or medium companies, just big companies, I think. Yes, thank you, Marie. Indeed, uh, Forbes would be good for that, for, this, for, the bigger, um, for the bigger companies, for an overview of what's happening to the multinational world, let's say. Where else? Monica, it could be uh, the news, the news. And what kind of uh, what kind of information do you find out there? So in Forbes, we said it was the big companies. So what do you find out in the news? Economy, like you, you have to be update about how it's work in other uh, countries and to know how how to in, to use that information in, in, in our companies. Yeah, it's true. So you're right, Monica. And, and it's also I hear a lot of the global scale. It is, uh, it is a lot of information about things that are happening very, very far from from our houses, from our neighbors, you know, so there's there's not really, you know, so where do you get that from? I think uh, when you talk with other entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. when you talk like with your friends that have a business and and they told you like, oh, I'm making this change. When you talk with other entrepreneurs, you can have the information about what's happening right now. Absolutely, Alejandra. And I think you're quite right that if you just ask the people you know, maybe they already have some insights that you can use in your own business, or maybe you just keep informed about what's happening. But what happens to people who don't have the network of those entrepreneurs yet? So what happens to the starting out business owners who, who just began in January, who just began in March, just before the lockdown? So the news only covered global issues. The Forbes covers multinational issues. So that was the thinking behind the project lockdown economy. We thought we need to bring out the real stories of people who live right next to us and they are just like us, are faced with some serious trouble that the world has never seen before. Well, let's see, what was the first reaction from... They were courageous enough to tell me in those interviews what they really felt when the lockdown happened, when the pandemic happened. Those words are the snippets of the different interviews I had with them. And you see the fear, the panic, the, the powerless, the confronted, confined how do you turn that around as an entrepreneur 
when you see your business failing and you feel all those things that you see on the slide, what happens next? It's true that the bigger companies, they're much more resilient and the smaller companies didn't even have that much support uh, initially from government subsidies. And it's, it's quite difficult to apply for and you really have to know what you're doing, you know, which brings us back also to the information sharing. Sometimes people don't even know about the subsidies and sometimes they don't know how to apply for them. And that again, you know, this is, what was one of the reasons why we decided that we need to have this interview series that is available for everyone. From the first reaction uh, comes the next moment. So when you decide, like Gabriel, you said, some people had to close. Unfortunately, it's true. One of the options was to say, you know, let's just call it a day because if we continue, we're just gonna drain more money into this and nobody knows how long it's gonna take. But luckily there, there were some entrepreneurs, there were some businesses that were a bit more resilient. So they didn't have employees, for example, and they thought, well, maybe they can try and adapt to this new situation. But then here's my question to you again. If you were, if you were a business owner at this time and you saw that everything is failing and the pandemic completely jeopardizes it, how would you go about trying? So what principles would you use? What actions would you take to save your business? Any crisis gives us some opportunities and we have to be patient to look what we can do and what opportunities can be adapted in our, our companies in different ways. That's a very good one. So the resilience and, and really looking inside and thinking, how can you reinvent what you're already doing in the new conditions? That's a very good one, Gabriela. Anyone else? The company has to be very elastic in order to survive. At some point, you have to make this a very difficult decision to either keep the people you're working with and drain all your resources so the company ultimately fails or let go some or sometimes a lot of the people in order for the company to survive but if the company survive you can always rehire them elasticity aspect of the company really stuck with me and that's what i always try to apply and, and that's what made me stay afloat this time that's a very, very good point, Luis. Thank you very much. Well, what you mentioned about the job loss and letting people go, that I think we better not go into this in this talk because it is such a big issue and it has been so painful for, for many people, both the owners and the employees. Let's just park it for the moment. But what you say about elasticity in terms of the adapting the size and your operations, that, that's really good. You will see uh, later in these lessons that I'm going to talk about that that was one of, their, one of the things that people did. You have to cherish your clients and customers. You know, they're the heart of your business. And during the lockdown, when it happened, we saw a lot of businesses that were nice to have. They were no longer needed. So for example, coaching, training, facilitation. Most of those services were nice to have. So they were not um, really necessary like food and water and shelter. So in here, I would like to give you um, an example uh, from Thailand. It's a story of Pumnarodi Kristanin, and she is in charge of the um, transformation consultancy. Mainly they do facilitation, facilitation for groups. So they come there in person and they trigger the conversation, they trigger the thinking, the brainstorm, the group dynamics, and then the company comes up with a better way of how to tackle something. So it sounds very useful, but you can imagine with the lockdown, their clients had other priorities, more pressure, less time, but Pum and her team didn't just stop and did nothing. They actually stayed in touch with her clients and they asked about what they were doing, how they were feeling, what could be helpful on their side. In the conversation that Pum had with her clients, she noticed that many of them were working on the COVID relief program, but they were all working independently, so they were not connected to each other. And of course, using her facilitation experience, she brought all of her clients together to, to work on a joint program that would be more impactful. And that allowed her to be more connected to her clients and to stay useful. So uh, maybe some of you have examples uh, of that 
from your surroundings. Maybe, you know, a business owner who did something like that. Maybe you wouldn't bring them up. Yeah, Julia, I have an example. I have a friend who has a travel agency. So as you know, travel has been postponed for a while because of the COVID situation. So she's been doing like this virtual uh, webinars where she partners with other agencies and they target a different country every time. So she's like doing this, um, like a virtual travel thing and all of her clients are joining and they're saying, well, maybe I, I should go there next time. Maybe I'll book uh, a, a travel with you in a few months. So I think that should be something similar to the support and help pro bono maybe. Yeah, absolutely. That's an excellent example, Maria. Thank you very much. Because indeed, right now, it's probably not bringing them any money, but it allows them to create the community of clients, to create the, the, the nice feeling that, you know, when things are going to get better, this is where they're going to go for, right? The next lesson is, of course, collaborate. So similar to what we're doing here, with Alejandro representing the university and me representing the think tank and we doing this talk for you guys, that can be done anywhere. One good thing of the lockdown has been that many entrepreneurs in the similar line of work realize that they're actually in the same boat and they cannot uh, overcome these challenges on their own. So they started partnering, even if there were competition. And that's uh, one of the interesting terms that I heard during my interviews was uh, brought to me by Rishi Kapal. He is the managing partner of the Global Scale Up. So one of the things he mentioned to me is the word co-opetition. That is the competition and cooperation in one. When you collaborate with people who are normally your competitors for the greater good of humanity. You exchange contacts, information, you share connections, you do some projects together for the better world. And it is definitely a positive outcome of the, of the lockdown. Do you know any examples? Yes, I see uh, that Gabriel wants to speak. In the Mexican economy, the 84% of the economy is based in the family or business. It's true, the lockdown, the lockdown uh, has pushed us to, uh, to reskill but if you don't have the education, if you don't have the vision, if you don't have the, the tools, it's very complicated for the small and medium companies. We don't have the, the, the business culture. We don't have the contacts. Thank you, Gabriel. And it's definitely a, a very good point. Uh, it's true that it all depends on the local, on the local environment, local conditions. Sometimes they're just not thinking in that direction. And it's true. And that's one of the things that um, why I think the, the interviews we share are also quite valuable because then you don't necessarily have to go to somebody and ask them advice and collaborate with them directly, but you can indirectly learn what are others doing. And maybe there's something, some grain, some seed of idea that you can also use in your business. So anyone else? So a local restaurant that participates with another chefs of other restaurants and with local businesses also to make like a box with all the ingredients and they do purchase that box they they deliver it to your home and one in the saturday they gave live recipe and they cook together and you cook with them so i think that was a good example of collaboration between two restaurants the the entrepreneurs of organic products and also the idea of you when this new normal continues you can go to those restaurants that help other people also absolutely and it's an excellent example gabriela thank you very much indeed it's it's very creative and you know it integrates the delivery of the products right they, they still sell the products but they integrate it with the online add-on which is missing in many cases when when we look at an online online content sometimes we're like well there's so much online content but here online content was was in conjunction with the actual food on your table so that that is really really clever so great example thank you very much so we see that in many different areas in many different places of the world Despite the difficulties and the challenges, people find a way if they really want to make it work. They, they, really, they find a way to do something together with somebody else because, you know, in this crisis, we are all together and we cannot overcome it on our own.
And that is something that Louise mentioned before. It's being elastic, you know, so adapt fast. So this is what people, all the inter entrepreneurs had to do, whether they're making money or not making money. In this case, in the story that I want to share with you, uh, it was pretty serious because Claudia Deacon is the owner of vegetarian sushi restaurant. And she opened it in Amsterdam in January 2020. You can imagine just before the lockdown, just before the pandemic. And in restaurants, there are a lot of capital investments. There are a lot of, you know, you hire staff, you, you buy the food, you arrange the place. You know, there's so much that you pay up front. And of course, um, uh, it was very surprising what happened next, because in, not in a good way. You know, surprise usually has a positive connotation. So imagine um, a Sunday afternoon, the whole restaurant is getting ready for the evening shift, you know, for people to come and enjoy good food. You know, the chefs are working hard in the kitchen, preparing things that will be served tonight. And then all of the waiters are in house ready, you know, preparing their uh, tables and outfits and everything is spot on and everyone is excited. And then suddenly half an hour before she could open the restaurant, she received a governmental order that all the restaurants in the country had to be closed. Now, how devastating is that? What do you tell your team? What do you tell your customers who had reservations? What do you do with all the food? Now, what do you do as a restaurant owner? Okay, uh, now let's let's hear some ideas. I want to leave it there and hear some ideas. I Hi. see Carlos, yes, go yes. ahead. Well, uh, it's a, a small example, but my mom has like this uh, salon. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, to get the hair, hair, hair salon. Mm -hmm. So um, what happened is that uh, most of the, um, the products that, that she gets, they're like cre with credit, you know, they get the, the whole inventory and she, she starts paying. And as soon as she starts selling it and, and using it, right? So mm -hmm. she had like this big inventory and then we received like the the news too that she had to to close and you know in a hair salon there's a lot of contact so it, it has it had to be closed right so the idea that that we had together was that like she she had this inventory and it was going to expire not very soon but she had to like sell it somehow so she started like talking to to her clients and start selling the products and instead of of her being the one that applies them she would like sell the product and in whatsapp try to like film some videos and explain them like carefully how how they could use them right so she, so she just started selling them online and kind of given like this um, tutorial of how to <laughs> to apply this this products so she could move the the inventory that she had and and pay the the credit that she had for the for the inventory Thank you, Carlos. That is a, a great example of really innovative thinking. And tell me, how did it go? You know, so did she manage to sell at least half of it? Yeah, yeah, it, it went well. And now, we, you know, we she didn't buy any more because it's complicated now. But she didn't sell all of it, but it, but it worked. Yeah. Excellent. That's really good to hear as well. I mean, this is a serious business, also a lot of capital investments and. Uh, it's, it's so not easy, you know, for people who have their uh, coaching or facilitation business where, well, you just have to be yourself, you have to have a computer, you have to have your knowledge. It's easier to be adaptable, right, than to, for people who have a hair salon or who have a restaurant. So basically, on Sunday, they could not open the restaurant anymore. And Claudia, well, you know, she's a young entrepreneur. She has recently graduated from an entrepreneurship academy. And it was her first venture, but she had to make decisions, very, very important ones. And she said, let's go into delivery. And they contracted Uber Eats and some local provider. And immediately they started um, say, sending the food uh, to clients' houses. But there is a catch. I don't know if any one of you uh, have experience with Uber Eats on a side of the food provider. Well, in my experience, I try not to use so much Uber Eats because um, I don't trust the delivery guys. So I rather use the delivery system that the restaurant has because it gives me more um, trust of the quality of how they deliver the products. 
Absolutely. Now that I've heard a lot of horror stories on how much Uber Eats and the apps, I don't know if it's only here in Mexico, they take a really big percentage of the earnings of the actual it's restaurant. It's true. It's everywhere. So, and that's exactly what I wanted to mention. Uh, yeah, because... so it's not that much of a benefit for the restaurant. But I, I'm not a restaurant owner, but yeah, you hear a lot of it here in Mexico. Like, oh, more taxes, more percentage. And it's actually not working out for some restaurants. Absolutely. And on top of that, thank you, Christina, you have what Maria mentioned that the customers themselves, they don't trust the delivery system because they want to work directly with the, with the restaurant. But, you know, restaurant has to set it up. They have to come up with that idea. They have to invest into it. And Roberto, did you want to mention something as well? Here in Mexico, what they are doing and the restaurants are trying to invest more in the social networks of their own, own pages. So just try to get some clients directly to the restaurant and not order by uh, app like Uber Eats. Yes, absolutely. Uh, all three comments are very, very valid. And it's true. So basically what Claudia found out is exactly that, that first of all, they don't have any interaction with the customer. And the percentage that, that Uber Eats and other platform take is incredible. And you just working for them, for those platforms, basically as a restaurant owner. And you're not making any money. So practically, um, so what they did is they started uh, activating their local community, their customers that they already had contacts with. They set up a WhatsApp chat that was always available uh, for deliveries. And they just started delivering uh, the whole team, all the waiters and, and all the chefs and, and, the, and Claudia herself. They started coming out to, uh, to her customers. And they even inc included the pre-order on her website. So basically, people could pre-order a week in advance or a day in advance what they would want for lunch, which allowed them to also balance their sales. You know, they can predict what the sales would be like, which was really a clever move. From Claudia's story, I really like that, that she said that was a happy moment in the customer's day. You know, she would come and she would see some customers every day and it would be the happy moment. And imagine the loyalty those people will have after the lockdown is lifted and they can come to the restaurant. So that's, a, that's a, actually a great lesson. I think it's quintessential that you have to always keep active, you know, stay active. The famous quote from Mark Twain says, find a job you enjoy doing and you will never have to work a day in your life. And we started this session from a brainstorm offline, right? That what is your dream job? And there's a reason why I asked is because what got the people, what got the entrepreneurs out of the low and deep point of the lockdown is that they, they continued doing what they loved. They continued creating, maybe not for money, but for the people they cared about, for their close ones, for their customers, for the future, just, just thinking of something. So in this case, uh, Dani's example is, is really a good one. She's based in London. She is a creative co creativity coach and the founder of Creative Wavelengths. And of course, all her classes are done in person. All her trainings are done in person. And lockdown to her arrived really suddenly. She was in the middle of the workshop in London. And then somebody came into the room and said that the building has to be emptied and everyone has to go home, just like that, in the middle of it. Of course, that leaves a really, really bad impression. And the whole lockdown was an ro emotional roller coaster for her. But instead of pitying herself, she developed several online programs for her clients and for her future clients. And one of those programs was actually to help people to come out from the fear into the positive state of mind during these challenging times. So there's always something that we can do. You mentioned already the travel, uh, the travel agency, uh, the restaurant, you know, they're all good examples, the, the gas stations, uh, the hair salon. So you see all, already from your examples, uh, people who survived the lockdown are the people who stayed active. We can now summarize the four lessons. And of course, you know, these are just the key four. I was so inspired when I was doing the interviews because every interview has a bunch of ideas, many inspiring things that you can replicate, that you can learn from. And I invite you to have a look at the videos. I know that part of the, your course now with Alejandro would be to look at them. And I am really happy for you because it seems like 15 minutes is not a lot, but 
you learn so much and from all the different places of the world. There are things happening, you know, our challenge is only how do we spread this information? How do we reach the right person? And it's a question with any business, right? And even with the social initiative, it's the question, how do we bring this knowledge to those uh, micro and small businesses in Mexico, for example? As you saw, it is a social initiative. It is a source of information, inspiration, educational materials, and it fits with the sustainability development goals of United Nations. Uh, the better education, economic growth, better health, better mental health, which is very important. And of course, reducing inequalities. I'm very happy that with you, the MBA students of the Anahuac Mayab University, we are now, and with the help of Alejandro, of course, we are now starting the pilot of the Lockdown Economy Academy. That is where the uh, students will be connected to the real businesses. And I'm really excited to see how it's gonna go. The real business is from the interview series that we've done. And once it's it's complete, you know, then we're thinking about the, launching an online course based on that. So there are lots of plans, I'm very excited. And uh, to leave you with a thought, now when the world is going through such a foundation shaking change, it is more important than ever that we can tell the story of what is really happening to the business and help one another rebuild our own ventures and the world, one entrepreneur at a time. I invite you to take part beyond your MBA co course with Alejandro and with the Think Tank Alter Context, because we need volunteers to promote, to reach the right people, people who are looking for this kind of advice. We need to reach them and we need your ideas on how to do that, to build partnerships, and you know, rebuild the world one entrepreneur at a time.